Uh, this is Richard Stanford. Today we're going to do Tombstone, uh, the Earp Brothers, and uh, Doc Holliday, and what uh, the book calls um, the Vendetta Ride from Hell. You may not have heard of it. I didn't really know much about it either. It's not part of the normal narrative of the gunfight at the OK Corral. Uh, but we're going to do that too, so we're going to know a whole lot more about Tombstone in the early 1880s than we've ever known before. Uh, now, that area of, of the, the continental United States was not a state back in that era. Uh, in fact, it, it was owned by Mexico until 1853-54 when the Gadsden Purchase added to the, the, final, the final boundaries of the United States, the continental United States, uh, by adding uh, the Gadsden Purchase with portions of southern New Mexico and southern Arizona, uh, which were all part of what was then known as the New Mexico Territory. But it was big enough that they split it up before Tombstone was born, uh, about the time Tombstone was born, and it was split up into uh, the territories of New Mexico and of Arizona. As you remember, both those states joined the Union long after this in the early 20th century, so these were territories. And Tombstone was within the territory of Arizona. Uh, there was a territorial governor who was not all that uh, uh, attentive to his duties, the, the famous pathfinder, uh, John Fremont, a uh, candidate for president of the United States in 1856, on the re first Republican candidate for president. Fremont was uh, given the political job of being the governor of the Arizona Territory, but he really didn't stay there much, and so it was pretty wild and woolly. So. Here we're talking about Arizona Territory near the Mexican border. Uh, and as with almost all these towns, uh, this town started because uh, there was, there was uh, mining done and silver was found. The history of the United States in this short period of, of the frontier, the history between 1865 and when the frontier kind of closed in the early 1890s, uh, is full of all these boom towns where people found Silver, gold, you know, Comstock Lode, the, the Virginia City. In 1848, uh, earlier, they'd found gold in California. Deadwood uh, up in the Black Hills and, and, uh, and Tombstone, which was silver. Uh, so silver was found in, in the uh, fairly late 1870s and uh, by Ed Shifflin and his brother. And all the Frontier, I hate to call them that, but all the frontier riffraff headed for the diggings because that's where you could make some quick money. And you could make quick money not only mining, but doing all kinds of ancillary things. Stealing cattle, uh, gambling, uh, opening bordellos, uh, all, the, all the things that went with it, some of which were honorable. You could be a stagecoach or express uh, driver for Wells Fargo or whatever. The Earp Brothers did that a lot. Uh, so you had all kinds of folks, and, and as one person said uh, in, the, in the early 1880s about Tombstone, there, there are 6,000 people, 5,000 are bad folks, of which 1,000 are outlaws. So I guess that just leaves 1,000 of what that writer thought were good folks in Tombstone. Uh, so this era, this era um, a lot of names, I'm going to list some. Tombstone, we know. Dodge City and Abilene from all the cattle trade that flowed through there. Uh, the Lincoln County area of New Mexico where they had the Lincoln County Wars. Think Billy the Kid. Uh, Virginia City, Deadwood in the Black Hills. And a place you don't hear much about but, but, but was a great old Texas frontier town uh, in Shackelford County, Fort Griffin. There, the old Fort Griffin was an Indian fort until the need to protect from Indians moved farther west. And the town of Fort Griffin around it had all kinds of gamblers and bordellos and, and all kinds of uh, the usual thing that came with, with uh, frontier towns. Uh, that's in fact where Wyatt Earp met Doc Holliday. And after that they were close friends and, and always were close friends. Um, now, what's amazing to me and something in this book that just reminded me of, of how these people got around looking for easy money 
was how mobile uh, these, these gamblers and people who set up bordellos and saloons, uh, they, they, they could go from California to Arizona Territory to Lincoln County and New Mexico Territory to Deadwood uh, to Montana. Uh, they moved where the easy pickings were and, and uh, uh, oftentimes uh, they brought violence and trouble with them. But, but um, Tombstone was like a lot of those towns when, when you when the people start coming in, the people that initially make money are the people that, that uh, uh, break up the area into lots and, and own the real estate and build things and sell land and that sort of thing. And, and so it was one of those kind of towns. Uh, uh, I want to define some terms now before we even start talking about the herbs uh, and, and all the others that will play a part in this story. I uh, want to talk about uh, what this book means when he calls somebody a cowboy. You and I think of a cowboy that, that runs the range, fixes the fences, etc., um, punches the cattle. Uh, well, cowboys did that, but so often the term cowboy in a place like Tombstone uh, meant somebody who was kind of on the other side of the law. They may be rustlers, uh, they certainly stole things, uh, they could be really rowdy, and they could be really trouble, wild kind of people. You're going to two, see two cowboys uh, that are lifted up in this book, amongst many other cowboys in that area. Uh, one of them is John Ringo, Johnny Ringo. Uh, he was a cowboy right in this area. Another was uh, William Brocious, Curly Bill Brocious. And these were, these were folks who were pretty mean and pretty tough and were generally on the other side of the law, uh, often working for the ranchers in the area. Um, the word ranchers could mean all kinds of different things. Uh, uh, Hooker, uh, one of the great ranchers in that area of the world, uh, was later the, the, the cattle king of Arizona was his name. Uh, he always got along well with the herbs. Uh, but there were a couple ranchers in the area of Tombstone, uh, and I'm talking particularly about the Clanton family, uh, Newman Clanton and his sons Billy and Ike and Finn, and the McLaurie brothers, uh, Tom and Frank. Uh, all, of, all of them were ranchers in the area. But when you talk about ranching in that area, you have to remember that what we may be talking about with a lot of these ranchers is rustling. Uh, this was so close to the Mexican border that if you didn't want to spend money like Hooker did uh, breeding and raising and doing it the right way, you could undercut the prices pretty well by sending cowboys across the border to steal them in Mexico. Uh, the, 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 the Mexico Northern Mexico was subject so much then to uh, bribery of people and, and poor law enforcement that the poor Mexicans who, who held the... Uh, the, the herds, uh, you, could, you could wrestle cattle from them all the time, run them across the border, rebrand them, and put them on your ranch, and you had cattle you didn't have any money in other than paying cowboys to go grab them. And so uh, that's something you need to remember about this part of the country. The Clantons and the McLaurys were deep into that. Um, now, um, need to also talk about the main characters uh, in this book. You know them. Uh, and I would say at this point, put all those movie images out of your mind. Uh, movies, movies and TV shows have been made out of this over and over again. My Darling Clementine, um, Gunfight at the OK Corral, uh, more recently Tombstone, uh, the TV shows Gunsmoke, Bat Masterson, Wyatt Earp, uh, and, and more recently, Deadwood. Um, uh, they all get a little flavor of it, but, but uh, the reality of it, uh, ironically, even though it was overdone, uh, Deadwood probably may have been the mo most realistic of all of them, um, uh, although they may have made it too rough in Deadwood. But um, anyway, anyway, those, those are... Uh, those are those kind of towns. Um, 
were different than the movies actually portray. Another, another thing we need to be real careful about is defining a law officer. Uh, the ERPs we'll get to in a moment, but they were always off and on all three of the main well-known ERPs, uh, Virgil and Wyatt and Morgan, they were all law officers uh, at one time or another. Um, but it can get kind of confusing because in a territory like the Arizona Territory, uh, you had a U.S. Marshal in a certain area. That U.S. Marshal had deputy U.S. Marshals. Virgil was a deputy U.S. Marshal. Uh, Wyatt at one time was a deputy U.S. Marshal. Um, you had you had U.S. Marshal deputies. That's federal. Uh, you also had the county sheriff. Tombstone was uh, split off of Pima County and became part of Coast Chiefs County at one point in time. And so you had two different sheriffs fairly nearby, one in Pima County, one in Cochise County. Uh, the Cochise County Sheriff was, uh, that county was based in Tombstone. Um, so you had a sheriff and that sheriff had deputies. So you had U.S. Marshals, deputy U.S. Marshals, uh, county sheriffs, deputy sheriffs. You also have uh, usually a town marshal and maybe a deputy town marshal. Uh, and those people are, are basically employed by the town in order to do uh, law enforcement. So you have all three different levels of law enforcement, and, and sometimes that gets lost in the story of these places. Um, now, when we use the word in this book, wife, you have to be real careful in this era because every once in a while you are actually legally married to your wife more often than not at best, you could call it a common law relationship. Uh, you were not legally married. So most of the ERP wives, one or two of them were married to ERP brothers. Most of them were just women who lived with the ERP brothers. So you have to watch the word wives. Um, so um, you have to look at early mining towns like this, and you've got all these different levels of law enforcement. But it's pretty unregulated, and there's a lot of politics that goes on, and, and you've got to be real careful um, uh, about whether the law officer in charge is allied with the, the, uh, the upstanding folks in the city, uh, county, or whether he's really allied with uh, people like the rustlers and the cowboys, the ranchers. So there's a lot of politics uh, that goes back and forth. Uh, sometimes law officers didn't necessarily enforce the law for the citizenry as much as they were uh, uh, tools of the local people in charge who might be rustlers, might be cowboys. Um, this book is just full of gunfights, hair trigger tempers, um, all kinds of, of brutality that went on. These places had rough edges, but one that I found particularly amusing, I'm going to read, because it's just so trite, but gives you an idea of what a hair trigger and a bad temper can do over almost a, 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 a nothing uh, argument. <clears throat> this is the story of uh, a fatal garment. It's the headline of an article in the July 23rd, 1880 edition of the Tombstone Epitaph. Of course, that newspaper is very famous from TV shows and otherwise. I'd never really thought about the irony of that name. What does a tombstone have? It has an epitaph. So if the tombstone epitaph, uh, Mayor Clum actually owned the tombstone epitaph, um, and it's about Tom Waters, who had the misfortune to be wearing the fatal garment. Uh, Mr. Waters and E.L. Bradshaw were both miners and friends who had the worst kind of falling out. On the morning of July 22nd, while in town, Waters bought a blue and black plaid shirt and, quite proud of himself, wore it on what was apparently a day off from digging for silver. The colorful t pattern was a tad loud, and passers-by remarked on it, which irritated the wearer, Mr. Waters. The peeved Waters sought shelter in Tom Corgan's saloon on Allen Street, where he declared the next person to comment on his new shirt would get a sock in the jaw. Uh, 
In walked Bradshaw, who innocently complimented his friend on the new garment. Waters' aim was off, and he hit his friend above the left eye. The effect was the same, though. Bradshaw fell unconscious to the dirt-filled floor. This is all over saying, what a great new garment. But, but Waters had just heard enough of that. He remained there as Waters left. He visited other saloons, announcing his continuing displeasure at the reception his shirt received. When Waters weaved back to Corrigan's, Bradshaw was gone. He'd gotten up off the floor. The abruptly former friend Bradshaw, after shaking himself awake and rising from the floor, had returned to his cabin, washed up, found his pistol. When he arrived back at Corrigan's, he found Waters standing at the saloon's entrance. When asked, why'd you do that? Waters replied with a string of oaths. They were interrupted by the sound of gunshots as Bradshaw fired, altering the blue and black pattern to include four bullet holes. Waters was dead before he hit the wooden sidewalk. Bradshaw submitted to arrest, but a grand jury refused to charge him with murder. You never knew why grand juries failed to charge people with murder, but they did. Perhaps some of his members had gotten a gander at the dead man's shirt. <laughs> so that's, that's the kind of thing that could get you shot in tombstone. Uh, hair triggers, hair tempers. Um, into, this, into this atmosphere, uh, we also need to factor in Indians nearby. You know, you've got gamblers who are fighting. You've got um, rustlers and rancher rustlers and cowboys and uh, who are also shooting up town. But you're not that far away from Indians. The the Dragoon Mountains outside of outside of Tombstone had been the home of Apaches for as long as Apaches had been in that area. Uh, Apaches were not a very unified tribe. There were all, all kinds of different uh, Apache sub-tribal groups, but some famous Apaches came out of that very area. Uh, one of them was Cochise. Now, at the time all this takes place, Cochise is dead, uh, but, but there's another Indian who has been hauled off to the San Carlos Reservation about 175 miles away, who we know very well, and that is Geronimo. And so the Apaches aren't that far away, and you just have to keep the Indians in mind. So let's get to our main characters. The Earps come to town. Now, the Earps were the most peripatetic group of people you've ever seen. It was California, Montana, uh, Colorado, uh, New Mexico Territory, Arizona Territory, even Texas. And, and, uh, and they were a really close clan. A lot said that several of the brothers, certainly Morgan and Virgil and Wyatt, uh, all kind of looked alike. Um, they had different personalities. Virgil was kind of outgoing. Uh, Morgan was a little more temperamental. Uh, Wyatt was the quiet one, but he had a very great air of authority. Uh, that made law officering for him uh, pretty nice because he could just almost look a man into dropping his gun. And so uh, they had all done law officer work in various places. Uh, often this law officer work was uh, not enough to make the kind of living they wanted to make, and so they also did other things. Uh, older brother James had a bordello. Um, uh, Wyatt gambled some. Uh, Wyatt and Virgil and Morgan all drove uh, express and uh, wagon stuff and you know did, did hauling and that sort of thing. Uh, but they found that law officering wasn't a bad thing as, as supplemental income. And they did kind of have a law and order streak to them. And so uh, those three brothers are the ones we know the most. James uh, was only, uh, uh, James was around, but he was not that active, nor was Warren or Newton or any of the others. But, but, but those three are the ones we generally zero in on for the Earp brothers. Um, like I said, in Fort Griffin, Texas, while... Doc was gambling and Wyatt was running express to uh, Doc and Wyatt met and became fast friends, which was a great thing for Doc because the fact is Doc not only had a hair trigger, but he, uh, but, but he didn't, he had a hair trigger temper too, but he didn't have friends really just because of the uh, personality he had. He was, he was, a, he was a dentist. 
Uh, he actually, uh, dentist, uh, he was a dentist in Dallas in, in the 1870s. Uh, he had a tubercular kind of condition that, that caused him to go west to try to preserve his health. Um, but he and Wyatt became fast friends. Now, Wyatt um, was also a lawman in, in, uh, in, in Kansas, you know, the, the Dodge City connection, uh, as was another of Wyatt's friends that plays a little part in this but was gone at the time of the OK Corral, and that is Bat Masterson who was also a law officer in that uh, Abilene Dodge City area. Um, but Bat came down to Tombstone. Everybody came to Tombstone. Once, once one of the Earps found a place they thought was really nice, everybody gathered. They were very clannish, but like I say, very peripatetic. They, they went all over that side of the, of the West and often one as, as happens with Virgil, often one finds a nice place. He found Prescott, Arizona, and liked it. But then the, the silver came in in Tombstone, and all the Earps uh, descended on Tombstone, along with friend Doc Holliday, who was uh, always uh, great being around, being around uh, Wyatt. Uh, it, was, it was about this era. These are all immigrants. It's a new town caused by a, caused by a, a mining uh, a mining boom. Uh, all these people are new to the area beginning in the late 1870s. Uh, the Clantons, uh, Ike and, and the youngest Billy and Finn were all the kind of rustler ranchers but they were n newly arrived and the McLaurys, Tom and Frank with their kind of r rustling ranching uh, and, and so they were all kind of newcomers all thrown together um, I'm going to read um, a good example with Wyatt of what it what it's like to uh, have two very different kinds of jobs. Wyatt Earp was was a, a, in this case a deputy. No, he was excuse me. He was a deputy sheriff, not a deputy U.S. marshal. You have to be real careful. City, county, federal. Uh, he he was a deputy sheriff, and. Uh, but he had another business, and I'm going to read something about that other business. By early 1881, he had a piece of the action at, at a saloon. One of Milton Joyce's partners, it was Milton's saloon, was Sam Harris, a Long Branch, New Jersey native who had opened a saloon in Dodge City, bearing the, nation of, the, the name of his hometown. You remember the Long Branch and Gunsmoke? Um, so it's that same William Harris of the Long Branch Saloon. He was one of many businessmen who'd seen Tombstone as a fertile ground for a watering hole and had purchased an interest in the Oriental, the, the bar. It was much more than a place for Doc Holliday to shoot old and new antagonists. To her readers in San Diego, the writer Clara Brown declared that the Oriental was simply gorgeous and is pronounced the finest place of its kind this side of San Francisco. Now. We never think of a saloon that way, but this was a nice saloon that, that Wyatt owned a portion of. Uh, the or Oriental was nothing like the standard issue saloon often seen on screens, where cowboys pushed through the doors, clap dust off their clothes, knock back shots of cheap whiskey, intimidate the nervous and barely competent piano player, and during fistfights break cheap wooden chairs over each other's heads as the bartender ducks down. Here. Fine music was offered every night by good piano and violin players. Bet you didn't see that coming in such a rough town. Um, patrons dressed well and the menu was one of the finest in towns. The gambling room was plush and was run by men from San Francisco. Harris offered Wyatt an interest in the Oriental in exchange for dealing Pharaoh and sort, and sort of being head of security. The success of the saloon had caused a decrease in business for some other saloons, and the possibility existed that their resentful owners would cause trouble. That's the old fight between gamblers. Um, the offer came at a good time. Wyatt was no longer collecting a deputy sheriff's paycheck, and the Earp brothers' mining interests were not producing pro profits. They, like everybody, were out trying to mine for silver. If generating revenue at the Oriental Saloon meant not bouncing around on a stagecoach or wagon the rest of the winter as a well Fargo shotgun messenger, 
it was a welcome position. So, you have law officers who have other jobs, and they, in the case of Wyatt, it involved uh, dealing Pharaoh and, and, and watching gambling. Um, now, the thing to remember as we head towards October 26th of 1881, the day of the gunfight at the OK Corral, the thing to remember is that the Earps were more and more, despite all their varied business interests, associated with, uh, in the minds of the rustler ranchers and the cowboys, as people who were law enforcement. And so the, the great cleft had, become, had begun between law enforcement uh, and those who would rather have it a bit more lawless where they could wrestle and do things they needed to do. The trick in all of this is that the, the, the interests that were not law enforcement oriented uh, had a powerful lobby. Uh, their sheriff was Johnny Behan, uh, who in fact in some ways became a tool for the Clantons and the McLaurys and, uh, and the cowboy group, uh, people like Ringo and, and Curly Bill Brocious. Um, something happened that started the real argument that led to the gunfight at the OK Corral, the iconic gunfight of American Western history. Uh, a deal was made. The Benson stagecoach had been robbed. And Wyatt Earp knew that Ike Clanton and the McClaurys knew who had done it. He approached Ike and said, if you, dead or alive, if you get the people that did the bench and stage and I get credit for it, you get the reward. Well, that sounded good to Ike, but the one thing Ike never wanted to do was, was let people like Johnny Ringo and Curly Bill Brocious know that he was working with the Earps. Well, as it turned out, they weren't able to, to get them in a way that the, the, uh, the bounty was paid. But somehow it got out that Ike and Wyatt had made a deal, and Ike got real mad that Wyatt would expose him to danger uh, with the cowboy element by letting that be known. And so people were a little upset. Uh, you need to keep in mind that Ike was a big drinker. Uh, and Ike had, uh, on the 25th of October, uh, Ike was, uh, this is 1881, the day before the OK Corral. Uh, Ike had gotten plenty drunk and he was going around town. It was almost funny, just kind of causing trouble and being a nuisance to everybody. Uh, and then he ran into Doc Holliday and, and Doc Holliday took umbrage. And when he took umbrage, people could really get mad at each other. And so um, uh, they got mad at each other. Luckily, Virgil showed up and broke it up before either Ike shot Doc or Doc shot Ike. Uh, that night, uh, late that night, uh, Virgil went home to his true, uh, he was married to Allie, uh, went home to his wife Allie, and uh, I just want to read you what, uh, what she said. It's, it, uh, it's a good indicator of what some people thought of those two, Doc Holliday and Ike Clanton. The way Allie Earp put it, when Virgil finally crawled into bed on the morning of October 26, early in the morning after he'd gotten back from the breaking it up between Doc and, and Ike on the 25th, she asked him if anything was up. And he replied, oh, I've been trying to keep Ike Clanton and Doc Holliday from killing each other. Why didn't you let him go ahead, Allie wondered. Neither one amounts to much. And then she went back to sleep. Uh, but Doc, Doc was, Doc was, uh, Ike's, was uh, Wyatt's friend and so, uh, and would be needed because on October 26, 1881, the date of the gunfight at the OK Corral, uh, Ike was still staggering around mad uh, Wyatt, I forget whether it was Wyatt or Virgil, it may have been Virgil, hit, hit him over the head uh, 
and then they took him to the local constabulary to get fined for being uh, uh, disruptive. Uh, while he was still bleeding from his head, having been knocked over the head, he was fined and let go. Um, and so Ike was still out there, and all of a sudden, all the other boys started showing up. The, um, Billy, the younger brother, showed up. The McLaurie brothers showed up. Billy Claiborne, another one of their compadres, showed up. Uh, and they gathered down around a, a, a vacant lot outside of Fly's photo, photo studio, uh, right in front of the OK Corral. And they were waiting, and they were putting bullets in their weapons. Wyatt Earp had known it might come to this because the bad blood between that group and the, the, uh, the Earps had, had gotten pretty bad. Uh, just a couple days before, Doc Holliday had been gambling in Tucson and uh, Wyatt sent Morgan to Tucson to tell him to come back. Uh, he might be needed. And so when the Earps start walking down the street, and they really were walking down the street, uh, it was, it was uh, Virgil and Morgan and Wyatt and Doc Holliday. Um, Sheriff Behan came up behind him and, and tried to stop him. You got to remember, Sheriff Behan was part of the citizenry that believed in the cowboys and was in the pocket of the cowboys and the rustling ranchers. And he tried to stop them. And he said, Don't worry, Wyatt, they're not armed. Well, that was a lie. He later said he never said that, but uh, Wyatt held him against him. And so Wyatt didn't believe that. And so Behan tried to stop him, uh, but the, the, the Earps and Doc Holliday kept coming. And uh, when they got to the OK Corral, uh, this story, incidentally, is told in several pages, uh, one right after another, who drew. The, the actual first set of volleys, uh, they were within just a few feet of each other. It was, it was really in a, in a, uh, it was a shooting match of people standing, almost, not quite toe-to-toe, -to -toe, but almost. It was between Fly's photo studio and, and uh, the OK Corral. You can, you can see that today. It's, uh, they've got reproductions of those places in the same uh, configuration. And you can see how close it was and what a confined space. Um, what I did not realize, even when I visited uh, Tombstone, was that um, there was a lull. There was an initial set of shots. Uh, at which time uh, Virgil was shot in the leg, Morgan was shot in the shoulder, uh, uh, Tom McClory was, was uh, shot uh, fatally, as it turned out. Uh, Frank McClory was shot fatally, uh, and so was Billy Clanton, although he, he did not die until a, a few, an hour or two later. But Toe-to-toe, -to -toe, they just shot at each other for about 30 seconds. A lot of rounds went off. Uh, uh, Billy and the two McClary brothers were all killed. Uh, Virgil and Morgan were wounded. Uh, Wyatt and Doc, uh, I won't say were completely unscathed. Doc had a little, little flesh wound, but it was, it was really nothing. And so after that 30-second set of shots, um, they went over to look at the dead on the ground, and some, some of the, only Frank was really dead. The other two were reaching for their weapons, trying to defend themselves, uh, and more shots erupted. You had, you had a second round of shots, but at the end, those were the three dead, and those were the two injured, uh, and, and America's greatest gunfight had happened in, in, you know, in, the, in the course of a minute or a minute and a half if you took both sets of rounds that were shot immediately. You would think, well, the law prevailed. That was not necessarily the prevailing opinion in Tombstone, Arizona. Uh, Behan was, was pressured to arrest the Earps. Uh, there was a counter-narrative uh, that came out of the, uh, the cowboy uh, rancher group, and that was that the others had tried to surrender and had just been shot down in cold blood. Um, a, um, there was a chance that the Earps could be, and Doc Holliday could be prosecuted, and tried, maybe hanged uh, as a result of this. 
but when, uh, when the testimony was taken, uh, Ike Clanton was such a loose cannon as a witness that nobody really quite believed him. And, and his, his testimony was really not true. Uh, but people kept asking the questions of uh, whether the Earps were, were involved in a vendetta or whether it was law enforcement or what it was. And so uh, as a result, a lot of people felt like the Earps had actually murdered those, those uh, uh, ranchers. Um, that was not the opinion of the U.S. Marshal in that territory. Uh, both Virgil and Wyatt Earp were deputy U.S. Marshals at the time that, that these shootings took place, and the U.S. Marshal did not believe that. And the, the hearing before one judge, that judge found that that was not the case, and basically Wyatt and uh, his brothers and uh, Doc Holliday were let go. Uh, they spent a day in jail or whatever, but, but uh, uh, so anyway, uh, it was not as clear cut a, uh, in the people's minds in Tombstone as you might think. So, uh, but now they're free, <clears throat> and they should have known that this was not over yet. Uh, most of us, the story's done when you finish the gunfight at the OK Corral. It's all over. Well, it wasn't all over for the cowboys and the, and the rustling ranchers. Uh, they needed their pound of flesh for the death of the McLaurys and, and of Billy Clanton. Uh, there's a great picture you can see if you Google it. of the. Uh, there were three coffins, Billy and the two McLaury brothers, and they all had, uh, they all had uh, <coughs> at the heads... Uh, glass where you could see the deceased's head, <coughs> and basically, uh, those were propped in a in a local window on the streets of Tombstone, uh, with with a notation that they were murdered by the Earps, and so um, uh, it was it was not a done deal necessarily. Uh, after that, after that um, gunfight, uh, luckily Wyatt uh, and. Doc and the brothers, they actually hired uh, uh, Henry Fitch, who was, who was a f famous attorney. I mean, they had enough money to do that, and that's one of the reasons that they got off okay. Uh, Fitch had, had represented Brigham Young in Utah when he was accused of, of uh, polygamy and, and gotten, gotten the, the Mormon leader off. And so this was a well-known attorney, and so they were well-represented, uh, and, they, and they, they, they got off. Um, now, what is it about this vendetta ride thing? You may, like me, not even have heard of it. I was kind of like, what's the vendetta ride? Well, what happened within a couple of months after, after uh, the OK Corral? Uh, Virgil was walking down the street and was ambushed <coughs> by, uh, by uh, shotgun fire. Almost lost his arm. Made him kind of a cripple. Uh, couldn't hold the sheriff. Uh, couldn't hold the uh, deputy U.S. marshal's job anymore. Uh, so Virgil was almost assassinated. They thought he was going to die. Um, and and within a short time after that, Morgan was playing at a playing a pool uh, in a pool hall with a glass window behind him, and he was shot and killed from outside that glass wall. Uh, out, out behind, and and he died almost immediately, and so Virgil was caused to, to have a disability. Morgan was killed, and Wyatt Earp was a quiet guy, but very steely, and he, he decided that he was going to get the people that did it. Uh, he put together his posses, and that's what the Vendetta Ride is all about. Um, almost accidentally, they found Frank Stilwell, who was one of them, uh, shot him and killed him. Uh, in, I think it was Indian Jim's, this guy's name, uh, Mr. Cruz. Uh, they found him and shot him and killed him. And they were still out looking for uh, a couple others that they knew had been involved in it. But given the... Uh, the uh, politicized nature of life in Tombstone, Sheriff Behan, who uh, chose to think more that the Earps had murdered uh, 
the McClary's in Clanton, he organized a posse to go out and look for the ERP posse, although he didn't seem real excited about what might happen if he found them, so they were running around, but they never actually encountered them, although they could have. There's a, some great stories told in this about that, but, but the bottom line was um, um, they, the ERP posse was not punished for being a posse or for killing Stillwell or for killing Indian Jim. Um, and basically, at another point, ERP found Curly Bill Brocious shot him with a shotgun, killed him on the spot. Curly Bill was probably involved. Um, Ike Clanton was probably involved. Uh, Wyatt never got Ike, somebody else got Ike. But Ike Clanton was not involved, was probably involved. They found his hat behind where Morgan Earp had been shot. But, but the bottom line is uh, Brocious was killed, uh, Indian Jim was killed, Frank Stilwell was killed. Uh, Ike Clanton had to lay real low. Um, and so that's, that's the nature of the vendetta ride that, that occurred to avenge the, the disabling of Morgan, uh, disabling of Virgil and the, and the killing of, of Morgan. Um, now, that truly puts an end to the great feud, the, the gunfight at the OK Corral, the vendetta ride. Uh, you're probably curious at this point what happened to the main characters. Well, you know Curly Bill got shot. Uh, Ike was shot later by somebody. Um, Johnny Ringo was found next to a tree. He had been shot in the head. Uh, why it didn't do it, nobody ever knew who did it. It may have been suicide. He was subject, interestingly enough, to depression. And so Johnny Ringo very, uh, very interestingly probably shot himself, contrary to all the TV shows where Johnny gets gunned down with the Clantons and all that sort of thing. Uh, he died later probably by his own hand. Um, we forget in some ways how young some of these people were. Doc Holliday retreated to Leadville. He continued gambling. That was the way he lived, was gambling. Um, and Doc uh, ended up in Glenwood Springs, uh, Colorado, and died there. At the time he died, he was 36 years old. He died of the consumptive condition that he'd had all his life. Luckily, uh, before that, uh, Doc and, and Wyatt had had the chance to get together and relive old times and all that sort of thing. But Doc died at age 36. Um, Wyatt Earp has a more interesting story. You know, uh, they tell the story of how Virgil did this and how everybody's lives afterwards. Uh, you'll find it interesting, but, but everybody is most interested in what happened to Wyatt Earp. Speaking of peripatetic, Wyatt Earp and his girlfriend who he finally married, uh, Josie, uh, Josie Marcus, uh, uh, Josephine Marcus, they also called her Sadie, uh, had been the girlfriend also at one time of uh, Sheriff Behan, and that was one of the, one of the divisive uh, things between Behan and, and Wyatt Earp. But Wyatt found, Wyatt found uh, uh, Josie and, in San Francisco, he went from San Francisco to Idaho, to, lived in Galveston for a while, uh, all over the West. Ended up, ended up uh, owning an establishment in Nome, Alaska, uh, during gold rush times. Uh, the man, as with most of the Earps, just couldn't stay put, and so nobody ever thinks of Wyatt Earp as having been in San Francisco and Idaho and. Uh, Nome, Alaska, and Galveston, Texas. He was in all those places. But maybe the most interesting thing is Wyatt Earp didn't die until January of 1929. And at that time, he had finally uh, put down roots and, and had lived the last 15 or 20 years in, uh, in Los Angeles, California. 
it is ironic that a man that is so often portrayed as uh, in TV and in the movies as, as a lawman and gunman of the wild western period uh, would have lived long enough to be a consultant uh, to Hollywood studios on what the wild west was like, <laughs> which, is what he, which is what he did in the late 20s while they were making westerns about the various kind of situations he had lived through. So that's the story of the gunfight at the OK Corral and of the vendetta ride that came after it and of what it was like to be in Tombstone, Arizona, a rough border town uh, in, the, in the early 1880s. Uh, and it's typical of the Old West. It's a, it's a great story, and that's why they have made so many movies and TV shows about it. Uh, but you'll, you'll like Tom Clavin's book because it gets into a whole lot more detail about all of this and is more realistic to what actually happened than any movie or TV show. So I recommend Tombstone, The Earp Brothers, Doc Holliday, and The Vendetta Ride from Hell by Tom Clavin. Thanks. <laughs>